Thanks for coming, everybody. Everybody's here in the right class, right Saturday. Ornamental block grasses today. Not your lawn. That's in a couple weeks. We can talk lawn too, though, if you want. So, but uh, thanks for coming. My name's Trevor. It's nice to see you. quite a few faces here today. Uh, this is always a fun class. We'll get out of here before we get too hot. Uh, grasses we'll talk today and a little bit of fall perennials, some things. Uh, they're probably a little extra nicer as we get into fall. You probably noticed out there if you were out before uh, we started, perennials, grasses, all the above around special 20% off. Um, we'll do that here for you guys too. So just certainly take a look and do some shopping afterwards. Did everybody get the handout it's on the back chair? Everybody's got one? Some light bedtime reading. You know, only four pages this week, so it's not too bad. But the last page will give you a few of the, my favorite fall perennials too. Um, and then certainly there's a lot of other stuff we'll talk about when we get to perennial time. But we'll go through and hopefully show you pictures. I brought a few plants up. You can kind of see some of the different variations in color and growth habit, a lot of stuff. We say starting to plume, like bloom, get it? So these are all starting to plume here for fall. So we're getting kind of towards prime time here as we get uh, tough ornamental grasses. So grasses are perennials. So there's only going to be one that I'm going to mention in the slideshow a little bit later that's not that's an annual and will not come back but all the stuff we're talking about here is going to be perennial so things that we're going to plant in our yard expect to have for a number of years we've got the right location um, we'll have a happy grass for a long time very very stuff easy to grow um, they're extremely low maintenance you know i kind of half jokingly had a rule in my yard if i had to touch it more than twice a year you're out of here i'm going to get something <laughs> else and i break that rule all the time with too many things these days but but our grasses are very easy. I mean, besides cutting them back to rejuvenate them once a year, uh, which we'll talk about, maybe throwing a little food on them in springtime, that's it. You know, we give them a little bit of water here and there as we go through the dry spell in the summer, you got happy plants. I mean, it really is an extremely low maintenance way to go. Uh, the big one on a lot of these, and I'll mention as we look at specific types, is going to be drainage. We can't have heavy clay, especially in the winter time. The water pools up, heavy clay. If we have a, a wet situation, there's quite a few of these that probably will rot out over the winter. Uh, so we want to make sure we got good drainage. If you're on the sandy side of town, you got nothing to worry about. But it's the, the clay. Usually, if we get a little bit wet, we we'll have to be careful on which ones we choose. Um, all these are going to come into two two kinds. So we're going to have a clumping type grass. You know what I mean? I plant one, the clump gets bigger every year, a little wider, but it's not running and popping up over here and there. So that's our clumping type. We use a fancy word like naturalize. That's, that's a better word than like invasive or spreading or running or something. But if some people like, and I do too in some places, planting a plant like that that might run a little bit and cover an area. Keep the weeds down, naturalize really well. There's going to be some options for that as well uh, when we talk grasses. Uh, the big thing with me is, and I've got a lot of these in my yard. Well, some of the pictures are from my place. Um, you know, I think grasses provide something maybe that a lot of plants don't in the yard, and that's maybe a little bit of motion and some sound. You know, if you're out there and you've got a grass in the wind here in summer, fall, rustling in the wind, very peaceful, it's a great sound. So you can add some interest in your landscape with the color, with the structure, but also, again, I think that motion and, and the sound as well. So I would always kind of start, like with most of the classes I do here, by asking yourself a couple questions. You know, how much sun? or shade is this plant going to get in my yard and that's always kind of well you, i'm talking about summer i don't care about january when everything's dormant <laughs> so if we're out here now how much sun is this actually getting am i getting full sun am i getting very little or do i kind of have that typical you know marysville pacific northwest part sun part shade you know a little sun a little shade a little sun a little shade kind of thing so that's kind of phase one you know i like both types of grasses evergreens and perennials but that may be a question for you as a gardener. You know, do you want, you know, some people like, I don't want anything that turns brown. I don't want anything that loses leaves. That's not very fun to be honest, but, but uh, perennial grasses, we would have the seasonality, something we would start over again every year and have a brand new plant. Whereas evergreen things, we would have a little bit of presence in the winter time. So if you needed a little color, some green, some yellow, some blue, something that would give you a little bit of interest over the dormant months, then we would look more for the evergreen stuff. How much height do I need? You know, and that's going to be with grasses kind of twofold. You know, I have grass heights, and then I have a plume on top of that. So how much 
space do I have? I got a couple of Meyer that get you know, eight, nine foot when they're in bloom. That might be a little big for others. Other people want a nice specimen where it's going to have a little bit of room to grow. So we can go all the way from tiny little ground cover type grasses up to something eight, nine foot, you know, and literally everywhere in between. Um, you know, a lot of times with me is it one specimen, you know, I'm not going to plant a row of my nine foot grasses and I want one beautiful specimen and I can garden around it or layer plants off of it. So is it one single specimen I want or do I want a grouping, a swath, maybe sometimes the smaller grasses, three of them or five in a little group is going to make a much better presentation than just having one, you know, where it kind of gets buried by, by other plants. You know, kind of incorporating into your design a little bit, you know, I just mentioned that word, layered look. You know, most customers I talk to want to look at a typical landscape bed around their house and see low to medium to high to a specimen towards the back. You know, kind of get a little bit of interest as far as foliage again and different colors. So if you look at that layered look, grasses are ones that we have a lot of options for things we can put on the border down at that low area or we could get something taller if we're looking for a, a big specimen, kind of a little showstopper as well. But you'll see, not just from this, but the pictures here, you know, a huge amount of color, variegation, different blade size, different texture, when do they turn color, different flowers or plumes. So you can kind of find something, I think, that for your taste, it's your garden, not mine. I may like something a little more yellow, you may not like yellow. So pick out something that, again, is gonna be good for you. But just keep in mind, again, those evergreen things have presence year-round, and a lot of times for me, containers. You know, that's where I a lot of times start with my evergreen grasses, adding to a fall container that I can enjoy all winter. A couple years down the road, maybe I move that into the yard, you know, and kind of use it for a different purpose. So keep in mind, evergreens year-round, but the perennial stuff, I'm going to get seasonal color. I'm going to turn color in the fall. I'm going to probably get a much more attractive plume. I'm going to have that seasonality as we go through there. So two big things, you know, I, again, very, very low maintenance. I don't think I shouldn't admit this, but I don't know, you remember the last time I fed my grasses that have been in the ground. If I got happy soil, I got happy grass. So a little bit of water in the summer, I'm not going out and dumping two pounds of, of rose and flower food around my old specimen grasses. They're happy, I'm happy. Now, evergreen ones, if I cut them back, things like that, maybe I will look to feed them a little bit more. But I'm always gonna use a good transplant fertilizer when I'm putting a new one in. I want to get the root system established. So we get something like Sure Start or the, again the EB Stone Rose and Flower Foods, a great organic transplanter and a little compost mixed in the hole and a little mulch on top. That's going to give me a great start down the road. Um, if you could put food down once a year, you'd probably be doing better than me. I would walk out usually coming out of winter and I would feed my grass in March to April, sometime in that late winter, early springtime, if it needs a little kick to kind of get going. Maybe it's a new one, trying to block something to the neighbors, you want it a little faster, certainly some food will help you with that too. But this isn't something I want to walk out, put my liquid crack miracle Grow on my grass and sit there and force feed it every two weeks. I'm going to have a big tall green thing, it's probably going to flop open because it's just got too much nitrogen, so slow and steady is the way to go. Um, <clears throat> so once a year should be fine. Evergreen types, if we talk pruning, if you've got a little evergreen grass, like I'll pull up the, the orange sedge here, this is one of my favorites. So this will keep its color and structure all winter. If I fast forward to like next March and I'm like, okay, we got a cold winter, I got little brown tips here and there, this is never going to fix my problem. Cutting bl tips of blades off, you're going to get another section of brown, if that makes sense. So if I want to start this over, I'm going to pretend like I'm a barber here and I'm going to grab my clump of grass and I'm going to cut that entire thing off the ground about three, four inches above the soil. Now I'm going to put some food on that for sure and let it start to regrow and I'll have a brand new plant. Do I have to do that every year? I would say no. You know, for me, it's probably every three years typically on evergreen stuff. You know, they look great. They're starting to get a little tired. Okay, next spring, let's get you started over again. So maybe I'll cut it back a bit and have a new plant. But it's really that easy on evergreen. We don't do it in the fall. We don't do it too early in the winter. We want to wait till after frost and that way we can regrow very quickly and have a new plant. The rest of these perennial type grasses, they're going to turn color in fall. They're going to plume. 
it's going to go brown, I'll still have frost, I'll still have sound, I'll still have motion, all that stuff. It's going to be up to you. You know, I'm an OCD kind of gardener, so I fight my own brain and leave some alone so that I have the interest in the winter. Other ones, and you know, Thanksgiving to Christmas, if I'm done, I'll cut it off. You know, we go out to the ground, we zip it off an inch or two above the soil, take all the old blades, put them in the compost, it sits there dormant the rest of winter, leaves back out, and off we go again. The problem with the perennial grasses to me is if, you know, a lot of folks, I will do this someday, head south for the winter. You know, you want to go down and enjoy some sunshine in Arizona or whatever it is, and I'll, be, I'll see you first of April. Okay, well, you probably need to catch yours back before you leave town, because if we come back, we have all that old brown sitting there and the new growth coming out, we have a really hard time getting the old growth out of there without damaging the new, if that makes sense. So you could kind of pick, you know, November all the way to 1st of March, and you can cut your perennial grasses anytime you want in that time frame. It's just going to probably be up to your schedule um, and what works for you at your place, okay? Same with dividing and transplanting. Now, very easy thing to plant. You know, I can plant a plant up here year round. Of course, in the heat of the summer here, I got to watch the water a little bit more. I'm not going to leave town after I plant it. I just did that two weeks ago and I paid for it with a few things myself. So don't leave town for two weeks after you put new plants in. They probably won't be so nice when you get back in the heat of the summer. But you can plant these grasses now, fall, early spring, any time of the year. Again, a little bit of transplant fertilizer in there, some compost, and off we go. If I've got an older grass, very easy thing to divide. Has anybody got one of those like root slayer shovels? Anybody discover those yet? You got nice. So if you want a good tool, that's a great transplanting shovel. It's sharp as nails, don't hit your toes with it. But that's a great shovel to use. I could take a clump of grass, step on that shovel and cleave it into halves, into quarters, take a piece of that, move it somewhere else, share it with a friend. A very easy thing when they're dormant to divide. So as long as I have root connected to part of the crown, a very easy thing to split up. I just cleave two more big clumps of mine at my place this winter and put a couple new things in around the perimeter. So easy thing to divide, but again, during that, during that, um, during that dormant time over the winter, okay? Now, if we look through some pictures here, you know, try to pay attention, because again, everybody's got different tastes on colors, on textures. I love yellow, some people think yellow looks like it needs food, other people like red more, blue more. We've got options for all these different colors and sizes here with grasses. So look at the options you've got. Uh, there's a lot of cultivars for each species. If I take a plant like Miscanthus down here at the end in full bloom, that tall one, I could probably find a hundred different varieties of Miscanthus. And that would give me the options for two, three foot, four or five foot, five, six foot, seven, eight foot, different color flower, different color blade. There's a lot of choices out there. So kind of look at your options before you pick which one you like. There's new flavors, I call them, every season. Every year there's cool new grasses that come to market. Uh, new dwarf ones, especially these days, where people have liked to plant like Miscanthus, but I don't have room for seven feet. Can you get me something three feet? Okay, we can do that um, as new cultivars come out and do it that way. Um, right now, you know, it's probably your best time. You come down to, the, to a place like Sunnyside, late March, early April, and you see roadies and azaleas and fun stuff blooming, and you're like, why are you having those dead pots of dirt out there that don't even look like anything yet? So if we don't see grasses in the winter or March, we come look in the summer fall, because right now is when you're gonna see the color, the glory, the different flowers coming out that might catch your eye. So it's a great time to kind of look around to add some of these things in the yard. Um, and again, the last one there, um, you know, you consider some for, for containers. You know, I don't know how your spouses are. My wife's like, no more plants, please. But I always tend to sneak some more home. So um, that's how I usually win is I have many, many containers around the yard. And she doesn't seem to notice if I just bring it home and <laughs> add it to the pot versus the ground. Then in a few years, we go from the container to the ground, we go buy another plant for our pot. That way you can feed your, feed your plant addiction like I do. So there you go. But you'll see a lot of plants, you know, when we talk container design, uh, we'll have a great container, fall container class coming up here in a couple weeks, um, here early September for redoing your pots for fall. If you look at grasses, it could be all three. We always talk about thriller, you know, filler and spiller, you know, for three elements of a good, good container that's attractive. 
and a lot of these grasses I could get a bigger one and use it as a thriller I could get some bushy ones use it as a filler I could use a lot of evergreen ones even as little spillers towards the edge of the pot it's going to be interesting all winter as well so if we whip through the list here um, you'll see on yours we kept it alphabetical by Latin not that you have to learn any Latin today but that kind of gets it organized at least gives you some different options as we go through but if we talk a few um, the first one I would mention is a chorus or what we call sweet flag this is a plant native to Japan this is one that does like some wet and this is evergreen so this is a short little plant I thought I brought one up here he's probably hiding where I can't see him here he is over here so you'll see that one on the table but this is one that's going to have mainly yellow we can find white variegated ones or even old sweet flags just green but that will grow almost like an iris a little bit from a bulb we could have that wet even sometimes people use it as a pond plant but we could get something just a foot tall or the miniature one there you'll see is only about four inches tall so this could be almost like a ground cover maybe it's an area it's a little heavier soil that you rot other things tend to rot out this will maybe give you an easy plant to grow in those type of areas so certainly sweet flag uh, would be one to consider and then the the pheasant grass has anyone tried that one I've got a couple of those going at my place too so that's the polar opposite of that first one this would be like hot 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 and dry 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 if I have clay if I have wet in the winter, poor drainage, this will rot out the first year. You will not have it come back because it's happened for me. But this is one, if we have hot, dry, slopey areas that we want an easy grass that's super drought tolerant, uh, this would be an excellent choice. This is going to be kind of the coppery, lime green colors. It is evergreen up here. You'll get a little bit of color change through the winter, but it will keep that color going through the winter, kind of a coppery one. And that's not super big, something maybe two, three feet tall with a little plume in the fall here. So um, if, as we go hot, dry, and kind of drought tolerant, this has become a pretty popular choice. We have a lot of people asking for these these days um, if they've got, again, the good drainage. Andropogon is one of my favorite big specimen grasses. You'll see this is one here. You see that tall one? He's got some flowers coming out. You know, even in a gallon pot, that's almost six three there I'm six three so that's about six feet tall in a gallon pot so I'm looking for something big specimen and bold this is one uh, blue stem or the big blue stem we would call this we would always get towards the purples and the burgundy colors you can see the colors on that already here heading into fall so that will give me the darker tones a really attractive little seed head on it but a lot of these I'm going to have five, six foot of grass and then a flower plume on top of that. So that's a big specimen grass. If you've got a hot, dry area, that one again loves good drainage, loves the heat. Really easy one to build, a really nice big one. That's one maybe one might do it, not five. That's a pretty, pretty big plant. So Andropogon, you'll see different varieties. Holy Smoke, Red October, we've got a few different ones out there. Actually, let's see which one this is. This one's called Indian Warrior. There's another one there. <coughs> so there's quite a few of those, but they're all gonna have that similar color change, bigger size, and then again, the purples and the burgundies um, a little bit earlier than you will see on some of the other ones. The next one's Butelia, we call Grama Grass. I brought one up here because it's really cool. Can everybody see that? I call this flat, they call this flag grass sometimes. See how the little seed head sits sideways? Looks like it's a little hanging flag. Looks like we're heading out to sea here. But that's a fun little plant. I thought about doing that over in Cleelum in our pasture at one point because I can mow it, you can walk on it. Um, that is again super cold hardy, super drought tolerant. If I can use that in my meadow, I could use it in a lot of different areas. It's a really cool flower on that one much earlier like midsummer so that's been blooming for about a month six weeks already we'll go into the fall we call that blonde ambition because it ends up getting kind of a straw golden yellow color uh, through the blades here as we get a little bit little bit colder in fall but I'm gonna have that really cool little flag grass on there so that's what's that now be short again this is one we can mow it if we want or weed whack it is what I would have done but this is one you might get just about a foot or so of foliage, and then your little your little flags on top of it. Yeah. So you can see from the picture, 
that I put on there. That one's a little probably a month from now where I'm seeing that blonde straw color kind of coming through in full bloom. And I'm looking like early summer, you know, on the other one. And you can see a lot of them there in the field. But that's one again, maybe one might not do it. That's one I'd probably think about a little group of three or repeat the pattern through a sunny garden so you get a little better presentation. So Calamagrostis or feather regrass, anybody in Everett? with me anybody are ever residents so you know the new YMCA yes so you know the the Carl Forcers I think they have probably 300 of them up there it's a very simple grass but it's really pretty would you say driving by it's like well that does look kind of cool you know it looks a little more native it's a really stiff structure straight up straight down you got the seed heads a little bit earlier I have the variegated form in my own yard because I like a little foliage color but feather Feather reed grass, whether it's Carl Forster or something green, or avalanche, or overdam, or the new one here is lightning strike. I'm going to have a, a manageable sized plant, you know, maybe just something two, three foot tall with my little seeds on top of that, but it's got a very nice little stiff um, kind of clumping structure. So that's another one. You know, one certainly is okay, but you've seen, if you drive by there at the Y, you know, literally hundreds of them in rows along the gardens look really, really sharp and very, again, low maintenance. If we look at probably the biggest group or one of them we'll talk about today, it's going to be Carex. So this is going to be, the majority of these are going to be evergreen. There's only one I'll mention that would go dormant in the winter, but this is going to be my evergreen clumping grasses for foliage. I brought quite a few up. You see the orange New Zealand sedge. We see one right here. Um, you'll see a bunch of choices out there where I can pick my color. Do I want white with green, gold with green? Do I want something a little different like the New Zealand sedge? But you've got some options for color. These are all going to be shorter evergreen ones. Again, if I'm going to start these over again, if they're looking tired, what do I do? i got to pick that up in April, zip it off three, four inches of the ground, and let it start over again. I'll say for me, driving around and always looking out my window at yards everywhere I go, most people don't cut back their Carex, and I think you'd be happier with the look and a lot tidier looking plan if you cut them back every few years and let them start over again. Because they do get a little tired here in the wet winter. So if we cut them back, we start fresh foliage, we got a brand new plant. So a couple to choose. The New Zealand Sedge I mentioned, that's just about a foot tall, lime green to coppery color. That'll always be that color through the winter. So that's an easy one. Frosty Curls is a real fine bladed Carex that if I like more silver, kind of a silver green white look to it, that's a great one for pots again or the yard. The new series of stuff that kind of has replaced, you know, a lot of the old Carex that I think these are probably a little better looking plants long term is this whole Ever series. So we have ones like Ever Lime, Ever Rest, you'll see Ever Sheen, Ever Rillo. I can kind of pick. I want lime green, I like dark green with yellow, I want some white and green. You can pick your blade color, but you're going to have again a nice tidy mounding grass that we can use in pots or the yard and have that look through during the winter. The Everillo is one I have, um, I like the lime green color. That one we want to do more shade, so if we have like morning sun, afternoon shade, or for me they're kind of buried in my garden, you probably wouldn't even see them during the summer. But when all the dahlias and the perennials and everything have been cut back, what's left, conifers, shrubs, the bones of the yard, now it's like, oh wow, he's got a bunch of those everillos kind of tucked in the garden back there. And they were getting shade all summer, now they're getting a little sun in the winter, which is fine. So, so we can do ones, again, everillo, pure lime, ever sheen, ever rest, gives me a little bit more of that white. And then ever lime's an interesting one, kind of two-tone green on the blade there. Uh, my wife calls these cowboy sedge. They look like leather. Who, who, who thinks brown looks dead? I don't. Brown. We call that chocolate. That sounds better than brown. But a lot of these, these cappuccino, the leather leaf sedges, that is the color. It's not for everybody. I tend to use them a little bit in my container designs. I have not done that in my yard, but I use them in my containers a little bit. But it is meant to be that color. That's not dead. So I want to make sure that's clear. A lot of people look out there like, why are they selling that dead brown sedge to somebody? But that's the color they're supposed to be. So we, we call it chocolate. It's kind of a chocolate brown red color. But uh, we can do different 
leather leaf sedge there's cappuccinos kind of a trendy variety because of the name uh, but that would be that color and stay that color all year and I, I would be again technically an evergreen type carrot I think this is the one I, they brought in for me is this feather falls yes it is so that's the feather falls right there and probably that one more than the other evergreen carex is going to hang a little bit more so that's again one we probably sell a lot of for containers people want that beautiful blade the color in the winter they tucked out the edge and let that grass spill a little bit around the container design um, the one on the other side there is in my yard so that's one called bulls golden i think we still have a couple out there but that would be a bigger growing carex that would be perennial so that is not that color in the winter i want to make sure that's clear i wanted a carex maybe three foot tall bright yellow foliage all the way through that one again can take some shade i have mine in total shade in my garden at, in everett um, but that's got a bloom in the spring a really cool little seedy flower comes out in the spring then the gold foliage comes out that you get to enjoy all season so we've had quite a few people like that one. If you want to see one after class, we got a beautiful specimen of it over in the, the Smith Garden next door. You can see it over there in the landscape as well. How does the feather fall through with damp? Do like with uh, moisture? Moisture is okay. Again, I wouldn't do like heavy clay, but I'm okay with wet. It doesn't have to be bone dry. You want to water the carex a little bit, but it just does, doesn't be soft and wet. Yeah. Uh, on the feather falls. Yeah. If you're going to put it in a container, how high does it get? Is it like something to go to the side of the yeah. container? Oh, it would could be right put... on the edge. Well, again, you if I had a small it... pond, I could use it in the middle. But if I had a, a decent sized specimen container, I'd be putting that in a corner and letting that spill over the edge a little bit. Okay. Yeah, we're talking just that tall okay. and more of that kind of weeping habit. Okay. <clears throat> now, here's some other ones. This is Shazmanthum. This is, they call it Northern Sea Oats. I had one here blooming. This is the last one I have. I'll get some more next week. But you can actually see the little oat seeds on that. That's real pretty. So this is one I have a few different places in my own yard. <coughs> I love the color. It's nice lime green. It is one you really see the seed head on as it starts to get into fall here. And that's again another one. A, we can take some wet with that one. That's a plant we would find usually upper Midwest, even growing in bogs and marshes. You know, Michigan, Minnesota, different areas like that. So sea oats would be one for wet, a little manageable size, maybe just a couple feet tall with the seeds on top. And I can do some shade on that as well. We can do sun or shade. That one's all about water, I hate to say. I don't water my yard a lot, but where I have mine is underneath a huge, ginormous Japanese maple I put in years ago. And it kind of is a little clump with the different perennials on the side. It doesn't get sun till five and then gets cooked late afternoon and I do water it a bit. I don't water that garden much but that's one plant. A little bit extra water in the summer will get me the seeds and not let it go dormant early. The years I don't water it, it probably turns yellow brown a little bit earlier and I don't get to enjoy the fall color or as much as the seeds. So a little bit of wet soil, not too dry and maybe a little bit of water. Not an, not an extraordinary amount but a little bit of water because that one we would not do drought tolerant on. Okay, on the seals. Ah, pampas grass. Anybody got pampas grass before I talk about pampas grass? Nobody has it, so I can say how I really feel about it. <laughs> uh, we'll just leave it at that. How pampas grass? Um, a, I, I will give you a couple things. These are really sharp. Um, they're big plants. You got to get a chainsaw to prune them. I've seen the neighbor do his over there. <laughs> Um, it's the, probably the prettiest of all the plumes, let's be honest. You want an old-fashioned feather duster, there's your pampas grass flower. I mean, that thing is beautiful in the fall. The rest of the year, personally for me, I'd say goodbye to it, but, but uh, either way. Not one of my favorites. Um, if we were doing this class in the Carolinas or somewhere down the southeast, I'd probably feel differently about it. But do you, how do you cut those back? Because I've seen... Oh, I would get a chainsaw and something super yeah, sharp. I, I mean... think you, you get your hand pruners out, you might be signing up for like a... 20 hours of work to get that cut back at. They're just really sharp, um, pretty thick and pretty tough. I mean, it's a tough grass. Up here, you know, in other areas of the country, these are evergreen. Up here, usually evergreen. If we get cold in the winter, these will go brown and then you're gonna have to cut it back like the perennial one so it can start over again come spring. Um, and maybe this one I might feed a little bit more if you want a whole bunch of those plumes on there. A little bit of fertilizer may help you. 
to one second. The pink one, I'll tell you, I searched long and hard. I don't know if anything is quite that pink on a pampas grass because I've seen pink ones bloom. They're a real light, light, light pink. Anything you see online has been photoshopped. I see them like flamingo <laughs> color, nuclear sunset colors. Like, yeah, that just isn't going to happen. So, go ahead. I was going to ask if there's a pink grass that yeah, we can. Um, we'll, I guess we'll get to a couple here in a second. Some of the penicetums will be easy. Um, so I, again, I don't want to offend anybody. Um, pampas grass isn't one of my favorite plants, but um, certainly it probably has a place up here too, right? We'll, we'll leave it at that. Desampsia, um, we get we get tend to get one called Northern Lights in. There's one right here in the front. It's a little clumping grass. Um, so they call that tufted hair grass, really pretty little small one, little clumping habit. That's one again, maybe one plant in a pot's okay, but if we had multiples of those, I think they'd make a really pretty presentation in most yards. Um, it's not super bold, variegated look, so it's not screaming yellow or white, but you do get a little pink typically in that one uh, with the green and the white colors, um, kind of a nice little foliage one. And again, big thing, short and tidy. Um, and that would again be a pretty good drought tolerance on the on the Deschampsias as well. Uh, probably the top of the drought tolerance are fescue and the old grass coming up here pretty quick. But uh, this is old Idaho fescue. If we were hanging in eastern Washington over there toward, towards Idaho, this would be grown native in the desert. You know, we don't need a lot of water on fescue. Um, if you've got hot, dry, sunny, well-drained locations. Uh, this is a really easy grass to walk away from if you like that steely blue color. I think, do we bring one of those up? Yes. Yeah, right in the front there. So you'll see, I mean, they're not going to get that color with a lot of plants up here, period. But with grass, that's that's the steely blue, the best one of all. So super short, you know, fescue grows little clumps. You'll get little baby clumps off the side. Um, that one, sometimes in the wet winters, it looks a little tired coming out of winter. So I know for mine, I might cut that one back a little bit more on April than I do some of my other evergreen ones, just so I have that fresh silver blue uh, foliage every season. But if I didn't want to water, and I got a hot dry spot, I mean that's towards the top of the totem pole for something you can walk away from down the road. Yes? Is that low enough to be a ground cover? You could use it as a ground cover, especially a lot of the newer cultivars. You know, I, you know, typically fescue, I might get that much grass on it, you know, maybe six, eight inches. But I think there's ones now you can even keep maybe a little bit shorter than that. Yeah. And certainly the, we used to say weed whacker, now we say string trimmer, right? <laughs> you could probably give your fescue a little mow job with a string trimmer, keep it shorter. When's the best time to move those? Um, any, again, going back to divide and transplant, anytime dormant season, I'm going to be pretty lucky. You know, if I walked out today and dug up one I've had in the ground for a year or two, you probably won't lose it, to be honest with you. But if you want to be safe, I'd say dormant season, easy, easy transplant time. Okay. Anytime. Yeah. If you transplant it this season or mm -hmm. coming up, could we trim it back then that same at the same time or yep. would you want to wait? Wait wait to always wait to cut back on evergreen till April. That's a really good advice I'll give you today because if you cut it back going in the winter it may not come back and you want to look decent in the winter. So always wait till April, whether I moved it, divided it, whatever it is. The perennial stuff, absolutely. If I'm gonna move, I do that all the time in the fall, Thanksgiving, Christmas, oh, I wanna move this, I wanna divide that. Whack it off down to the soil, chop it, divide it, move it, and then I'll, we're good to go for spring. But, but it'll go dormant in like October? Usually, it depends on what the weather does, always in the fall, but it's typically, mine are always looking really good about, you know, Halloween to Thanksgiving, to me it's prime time for the color and all the flowers. Mm -hmm. um, so usually starting then through Christmas, January, you got any time to cut them back. Um, Hacking a clue is a big one. This is probably the number one selling grass around here. I think most of us in our yards have shade. Um, we like grasses, we like color up here in the Northwest, so that's a really popular choice. Um, this is a plant that would start as a clump and would run. So I have patches of forest grass all over my different gardens. Um, some look a little clumpier because where they're located, but if I put one forest grass in, okay, that's gonna spread root and pop up another one and another one and another one. It's almost gonna form a ground cover. So if you've got shade, heart shade, especially those two locations, that's a great grass if you're trying to cover some area. 
Um, I love the color. They'll turn red, pinks and reds in the fall. It'll do a dormant about Thanksgiving time. We rake up the debris. We'll see you next year. I mean, it's that easy. That's a really easy grass for maintenance again. I will not have the color in the winter. That's a perennial, but I've got great color for a shade, part shade garden through the rest of the season. So um, the biggest thing with hacking a cloa is probably choosing your color. What, what do you like for your yard? You can see the first two there, all gold is going to be like lime green in deep dark shade. If it's getting a little bit of sun, we would be bright golden yellow lime, kind of a little brighter color. The Benikaze would be green. That's for the ones that are like, I don't want any yellow in my yard. I don't like yellow. Well, we get Benikaze because that'll be a crisp green through the whole season. And then that one especially turns like a burning bush red when we get to fall. Then we've got Oriola, which is this one. You can see the yellow with the green striping on it. Probably still the most popular one up here. And then the last one there, you can see with the fall color. So that's what I'm gonna be looking at mid-October, mid-November. The reds, the burgundies, the colors coming in on those before they go dormant. The brand new one uh, that just came out this year is called Lemon Zest. We still have some of those up there for sale. And that's an interesting one because it's almost all three colors in one. I've got some white, some yellow, and some green kind of all mixed together on the variation. It's a pretty sharp uh, looking grass. You can see those down there, down there for sale in our shade area. Okay. Heliotrichon is the other super drought one. You can see that same steely blue color. This is blue oak grass. But now instead of fescue where I wanted a little clump, now I want a little bit of grass. I want just a little bit of height on top of there um, for some more, more size. So this is one we would get probably two or three feet tall with that same kind of brownish oat seed on it here in the fall time. Uh, super drought tolerant. This is one again, we wanna make sure drainage is good. If it's too wet and it rots in the winter time, you're gonna get rust on these or they're gonna struggle. But if I've got high and dry and full sun, this is one that you can walk away from down the road and really water nothing around here as we get into the summertime. So once those get established, that's again towards the, the top of the totem pole for, for drought tolerance. Are you cutting that one back like in January? <clears throat> yeah, every, that one again year? is probably not every year because that one again is technically evergreen. Okay. Um, what I find with most people is they probably get a little bit wet around here. They get a little brown in the winter, zip years off in April again, let it start over again. If it's truly full sun, hot, dry, well-drained soil, I don't know that you'll have to do that every year. It'll still look really good year to year. And what if it has a little shade? Uh, a little bit of shade's okay. Um, again, keep the water off of it then, probably with a little more shade. You'd be even a little less water doing, doing part shade. Uh, the one thing here I put in um, that we can do red on is blood grass. I think we brought, uh, oh, I did bring one in poking me in the face here. <laughs> so that's our Japanese blood grass. And this isn't just the fall, this is the red tip color that I would have all through the growing season. That's different for grass. You're not gonna see that with a lot of plants. That one is not super tall, but who's got blood grass? How many blood grasses do you have now? <laughs> I, I keep it under control. You keep it under I control. Choose, but I, yeah. I mean, so, you know. Blood grass, we would use the word naturalize is a nice yeah. way to put it, but that one I think in some places they might even say the word invasive. Um, if we have an area, especially if it stays a little wet, I put a plant in, I'm gonna have a patch of it or a swath or a swale, which looks very cool in the garden, but at some point, like she mentioned, you need to tell it to stop. So we would just watch the perimeter coming out of winter, maybe chop a couple of roots and make sure it stays kind of where you want it. Um, it's a really pretty plant, but if we have open soil, great soil, we water regularly, we feed regularly, uh, that's a plant that might start popping up kind of all through a garden, which might look nice too, kind of depending on, on how you like your landscape. Yeah. In the shade, is it good shade? That one probably a little better and more sun. I don't mind parts on part shade, um, but we would want a little bit more sun than shade. And that one, again, would not be this in the winter. That would turn brown color in the fall. We would zip it off and that would be a perennial type to come back the next season again. Uh, Liriope or Lily Turf, you know, this is one, 
uh, this grass-like plant. I don't know that we'd really call this a grass, but we always bring this in and talk about it with the grasses. I've got one there, you can see in the corner, if I can reach that one. So I would have that grassy foliage, that's a variegated selection called silvery sunproof. But I actually have a flower on that, and these always bloom kind of late summer, fall. Lily turf, or the liriopes, um, are great little clumping perennials. That's an evergreen, so we would keep our little clump for the winter. We would see the bloom again the next summer. We can find whites, we can find pinks, we can find blues, purples, different colored flowers. And we can do a lot of green if we don't want the variegation. We can do yellow or we can do white. Um, you'll see coming up here uh, for different options on color. This is one again, um, and the container's real nice. I've used these a little bit in pots off and on over the years. Or if I had a little walkway where I wanted to edge it with a nice plant, you know, and have a little swath of those, you know, one plant it out in the middle of the garden is probably going to get buried again, but a little swath of them or a little edging of them would be would be very sharp. Um, so lily turf small, evergreen, probably a little bit more shade than sun. We tend to keep these in our shade area um, and not as much out in sun, but I'll tell you besides probably the heat we get in August, they're still not going to burn. You'll still be okay if you've got full sun on them. If you water them, this is not one we're going to call drought tolerant. Yes. How tall does it get? How oh, your foliage, you're looking at something under a foot for sure. Right. Usually six, eight inches, maybe a little wider on the clump, and then you, you, your clump will develop and spread a little bit. Yeah. Is it naturalized? This one, it, it does, but I'll, I'll show you some pictures. I mean, it still is a clumper. It's not going to run like some of the other stuff we've talked about. Yeah. If things are going to naturalize, will it be runners like a root runner, or do you do any of these? There's one or two I'll mention that'll seed here coming up, but not, it would be more from root system. Yeah, and this one not so much doing that. It's gonna be more clump, clump, clump as you develop sections. So there's Big Blue, a little lighter one. You saw the Silvery Sunproof. Silver Dragon would be the one we would get a lot of white on green on if you want a little brighter color for shade. And then just as an example, there's a white blooming one. You know, some people don't like blue, yet, you know, whatever your color is, you can find uh, Liriope or Lirio blues, purples, whites, even some pinks, um, some different shades. Now probably the biggest group of grasses up here um, and the most variation for tall perennial grasses is going to be miscanthus or what they call maiden grass. Anybody got miscanthus going in their yard? I've got quite a few of these. This is probably my first grass addiction problem. I have too many. Uh, but there's some really cool cultivars out there and now you know, 20 years ago to today, I'm going to be taking a couple of mine out this winter, to be honest, and replacing them with more modern cultivars because I'm like, that is just too big. I need to scale this down a little bit. And there's a lot more options now than there even was 10 years ago, let alone 20 for choice. Specific color, specific size, maybe a little bit, a little bit tidier for, for, again, a smaller landscape. So quite a few options here. I'm going to show you just a couple. This is kind of an example of your miscanthus. So that's coming up. I think this is, which one is this? So that's second wind. So that one that blew, that's one that's noted for blooming earlier, which it is. Mine is not in bloom yet in my yard, but that would be like a four or five foot clump of grass down the road. And then I'd have that seed on top of it. So that would be a big uh, specimen type miscanthus. So a couple here, You'll see morning light is one that we always try to keep around. That would be very silver in color, a much thinner blade. Looks very silver when you see an old clump of that. Maybe four foot tall on something like that with my little plumes coming out, so not super tall. Um, I have zebra grass. This next one right there they call stricta. Mine's about nine feet, uh, which is one of them are coming out of my house this winter. I'm going to scale it down a little bit. But that's a giant one, you know, if you're looking for a specimen, that's a perfect example of a modern cultivar. I can have the cool zebra grass, that's green blade with horizontal yellow striping on it. It's very cool, great for sun. Um, and now we've got options for smaller scale. I've had one, you know, that is a beautiful modern zebra grass. I mean, look at that, it's a beautiful little plant. You know, manageable size, great habit, great color. I'm still going to get my plumes on it. I think this is gold bar. That's gold bar. We can do little zebra. There's some great cultivars of that grass out now that'll just, instead of eight feet, 
I got two or three, you know, much more manageable in size that way. Stricta, like I mentioned, that's the full size one. That'll get huge. Uh, Fire Dragon is kind of like our second wind. You can see that's a picture probably from mid October, late October. So that one's noted for a specifically heavy fall color. So I want to go more red burgundy and really have a nice show in the fall with the plumes. That would be a taller miscanthus with great color. We can look at that landscape there I took a picture of. That's hacking a cloa, the really low one there, right around the driveway planting. And then if we look just to the left and above it, that's our gracilimus, you know, they call dwarf maiden grass. So again, manageable in size, it may be three or four feet tall, but a nice big wide kind of weeping specimen with those pretty plumes in the fall. And that's going to be more green. If I don't like the white, the yellow, the variegation, that one would give me a little bit more clean green. On the right there, Little Miss, you know, that's another example of a great modern cultivar. There's a lot of these new dwarf ones out where I want that plume, that thick grass, the great color in the fall from this canthus, but I don't have room for six feet, seven feet, eight feet. I need something tidy. So something like Little Miss is just going to be two or three feet. You know, I want that small dwarf miscanthus. There's Little Miss and a number of other new ones out there as well now. And then the last couple of Miscanthus. So Cabaret is one I have quite a bit of in my yard. I think I have three big clumps of that and I keep dividing it and giving some to my neighbors too. We'll have a whole neighborhood full of Cabaret here. But that's a bigger like four or five foot but I'm going to have white on green. That's a really pretty color. Um, we can still do full sun on that. It doesn't have to be in shade. But I'll have a nice specimen grass with a bigger blade with a really clean white stripe on it. Oh, it would be a little bit more size. <clears throat> the other one, the first grass I ever put in was that in my yard 20 years ago, Purpurescens, a miscanthus. That's an old school species. I think we might still have a couple. That's getting harder to come by these days. Uh, but I got it in specifically for the fall color. That's one that probably turns a month earlier than any of the other ones. It's a four or five foot tall one. I don't have to water it. That's maybe a little more drought tolerant than some of the other miscanthus. But the combination of fall color, manageable size and plume, uh, and towards the red purple side again, got me towards that purpurescence. That was one I seeked out uh, when I did my, my original yard. Another new dwarf one, Ruby Cute. You know, there's another dwarf one. You like that dark purple burgundy color, manageable size again, two, three feet tall. That would be another good dwarf choice, uh, kind of the new ones. And then there's another kind of classic, that last picture. You know, that's a beautiful miscanthus, and we could look at probably any of these down the road, and that is what I'm looking for. That fountain, moundy specimen grass that's full of foliage in the fall and great little plumes on it. Yakujima would be, again, like a four foot, probably six foot wide clumping grass. So that would be an example of the old dwarf, quote unquote, maiden grass specimen sitting in the landscape. So a few more here, Molina is called Moor Grass. I think we still have some of these out there. Um, that one again, I put a picture of a pot and I also put a landscape picture on there because I think that's a great choice for either. We could add a little interest in our container uh, with the Molina um, or we can use swaths of it or a block of it in our landscape for some cool color. That does get a nice seed head on it. It's got some pretty variegation um, and that one can take a little bit of wet as well. I have, I taught a class, this class for the NPA, uh, the Northwest Perennial Alliance here a few weeks ago, they came down and we had a long discussion about Moline and a couple of them uh, really liked it and even heavy clay, you know, where they had a little bit of wet in the winter time. It was an attractive little easy grass that didn't mind maybe getting a little, little wetter versus some of the other ones we've talked about. <coughs> now someone had mentioned, someone a bit ago mentioned a uh, seeding. So I'll just smile as I bring up this old stipa, I still call it, but now they've renamed it Nacella. Anybody got the Mexican uh, feather grass in their yard? How many do you have? They're in pots. <laughs> oh, there you go, smart one in pots. Um, this is one I kind of chuckle because it always makes me think of my mom when she retired down the beach. Uh, she likes this grass and she had a nice little beachy, rocky area garden overlooking the water. I think she put three of these or five whatever of these in and she probably has a thousand of them. <laughs> so, um, it looks beautiful, it's what she wanted, it's not my thing, it's her garden, right? 
uh, but these will seed, blow, and pop up everywhere. So if you have happy soil, you water a little bit, um, buy a couple of these and you'll have plenty of them down the road. Uh, Mexican feather grass, uh, super drought tolerant, really easy to grow, it's super low, it's not very tall at all, and it is really pretty, probably like she wanted, the prettiest grass you could ever imagine sitting up against water. You know, if you're on the sound or somewhere and this blonde colored grass, it's waving in the wind and making a little sound. It's a great looking plant, but um, it is not seedless. Let's leave it at that, right? Uh, Mondo grass is another one um, I always bring up in this class. This is one of my favorites. These are evergreen. These are low. They're almost ground covers, really, versus a, a plant. Um, not that I, you could probably come borrow some from me, but I have more Mondo grass than any human anywhere near here, I think, in my own garden. So anywhere it's shade, I just wanted something easy to keep the weeds down. I've got patches of this all over the place, and I pull pieces out, move them here. I'd look cool back there, throw them back in. Um, it's a slow-growing one to start. It tends to be pretty spendy these days on um, buying them. I think a lot of people look at the, you know, 15 bucks for a little plant. Um, you just get a few. Don't go overload. You put three, four, five of them in a nice area. Let them naturalize. It makes a great ground cover. They're really easy to grow. Um, this is one morning sun, shade. You could do a little bit of afternoon sun's okay, but I wouldn't go all day sun. I think these will get a little burnt in our summer, dry summer. Um, we do need to water these a little bit, not a crazy amount, but they're certainly not, not drought tolerant. So black Mondo grass right there. You can see the, the blade does get a pretty little flower, a little berry on there as well in the fall. Green Mondo grass, if you don't like the dark, um, the green would be the same way, little dark green clumps. That makes a great little, again, walkway edging, a little shady kind of ground cover. Uh, that might be a choice. And then now we even have variegated ones like that edge of night. I think we've still got some of these around. If not, more will come in for the fall. But that would be the dark black blade and I have that silver white variegated edge on it which just adds a, again a little bit of interest so mondo grass um this is something for year round this is a plant we probably sell more of fall winter january february than we do even in the growing season because another really popular choice uh, for containers because it's evergreen especially shady containers that'll trail in the pots a little bit and certainly the number one plant for putting in your orange uh, pumpkin for halloween right <laughs> Uh, switch grasses. I got one up here Starting to seed here and you can see the color starting to come in now in August um, This is a plant I started using a, uh, many years ago on my sunny bank I wanted something I didn't have to water um, That would naturalize give me a little bit of height give me some great color and just kind of look a little more native Maybe these are switch grasses or more prairie grasses but maybe a little bit more manageable than some of them is canthus. A lot of the switch grasses I can get two foot, three foot, maybe four feet on some of the taller ones. But I'm always going to lean towards that burgundy, purple, fire engine red. Depending on what color I like, the variety I choose, I'm going to get some of those colors every year in the fall. So this one seeds maybe a little bit earlier than Miss Canthus would, so they're just starting to plume right now. And you can just start to see the red coming through. As we look at a couple of the varieties here, and there's a lot of flavors of switchgrass these days, um, the biggest difference is going to be the color and how fast it comes in. So most of the newer ones are going to turn red, purple earlier, <coughs> late August, September, versus having to wait until mid-fall before we just turn out color, bloom, and we're done. So we get a little longer interest out of some of these. So a couple like Hot Rod, I think this is Ruby Ribbons here. Let me see which one she brought me here. That's Shenandoah, so that's one of the great plant picks. So that's close to Ruby Ribbons. So this is one called Shenandoah. But I would, you can see the dark on Hot Rod, a little bit more subtle uh, reds on Ruby Ribbons or one like Shenandoah. If we like that bluey color, that's a beautiful one called Heavy Metal. That's going to have that blue-green color to it.